something unheard of is happening right now. In September 2025, Earth faces a wave of near misses. Asteroid 2025 FA22 will slip past at just over twice the distance to the moon, while 2025 RJ2 surges even closer, less than 300,000 kilometers away. In the same breathless stretch of days, dozens of smaller objects are logged at sublunar distances, a record-shattering cluster that forces even seasoned survey teams to look twice at their dashboards. At the very same time, 3i Atlas, a chemically bizarre interstellar visitor, accelerates toward Mars on a trajectory that looks unlike anything in the Minor Planet Center's archives. The numbers feel improbable. Is it coincidence or a pattern with implications for how we watch and defend our planet? The answer may change what it means to be a bystander in the solar system. September arrives as an unbroken string of alerts. The Minor Planet Center posts 2025 FA22 at about 2.2 lunar distances, roughly 835,000 kilometers. Three days earlier, 2025 RJ2 had already cut even closer, just 0.7 lunar distances, under 300,000 kilometers. These are not isolated events. Between September 12th and 18th, at least 28 near-Earth objects pass inside the Moon's orbit, triple the prior weekly high. Most are small, 8 to 25 meters across, the kind that might dissipate harmlessly in the upper atmosphere or detonate in an airburst like the 2013 event over Chelyabinsk. But two stand out, FA-22 and RJ-2, with estimated diameters up to 120 meters, big enough to demand global attention. Each detection flashes across the consoles at PanStars in Hawaii, Atlas in Chile, the Verisi Rubin Observatory in the Atacama, and Catalina in Arizona. Automated telescopes sweep vast fields. Software tuned to catch the faintest, fastest streaks promotes candidates to follow up within minutes. Rubin, only months into full operations, adds a flood of fresh finds, its wide-field imager covering the sky in arcs that would have missed targets just a year ago. On paper, a week with more than 25 sublunar NEOs is a once-in-decade statistical outlier. Bias-corrected population models peg such a spike at lower than one chance in 1500. Even with improved capabilities, the September surge stands out as a tight cluster where history suggests random scatter. Some whisper about resonances or a fragmented parent body shedding shards. Most point to the power of new technology. Detection efficiency now pushes past 90% for objects larger than 20 meters within one lunar distance. The blind spots are shrinking, but not gone. Sunward approaches remain the soft underbelly of the system, a vulnerability burned into memory by the Chelyabinsk airburst 12 years ago when a city awoke to a shockwave no one saw coming. Social feeds amplify the spike with charts too sharp to ignore. Orchestrated, some suggest? A warning shot, others mutter. In scientific circles, the tone is measured but intent. Log, analyze, archive, update models. Planetary defense is only as strong as its latest detection and the timeliness of the handoff from discovery to decision. For a moment, the focus shifts from statistics to stakes. What if FA-22 hadn't missed? At 120 meters, roughly the height of a city block high-rise, the asteroid would begin its entry far above the clouds, a silent speck at over 18 kilometers per second. If stony, like most of their size, it would compress the air ahead until the pressure crushed it into a violent airburst. Chelyabinsk shattered windows across six cities and sent more than 1,500 people to hospitals with cuts and concussions. An object like FA-22 carries more than 20 times that energy. The blast could detonate between 10 and 20 kilometers up, releasing several megatons and flattening buildings across dozens of square kilometers. At the center, there are seconds, if that, to react. Glass would scythe through rooms, walls would flex and fail, rooftops could ignite in the flash. Farther out, debris and collapsing structures compound the harm. If FA-22 were iron, the scenario tilts. Dense and cohesive, an iron body could punch through the atmosphere, striking the ground at nearly full speed. 
The result, a crater hundreds of meters across, a fireball visible for miles, a plume injecting dust and vapor into the stratosphere. The local devastation would be absolute, though the broader environmental ripple would depend on where it hits. Over the ocean, two-thirds of potential targets, the energy couples into steam plumes and a train of tsunamis radiating outward. Deep water soaks up much of the impulse, but coasts within a few hundred kilometers could see walls of water tens of meters high. Ports, river deltas, low-lying islands, catastrophic flooding with little warning. The lesson from 2013 remains blunt. Objects inbound from the direction of the sun can be invisible to ground observatories until the last minute. Emergency planners now drill for events with no warning at all because the line between a harmless fireball and a city-leveling disaster is thinner than most assume. Not every September story is an asteroid. SWAN announces itself in ultraviolet. On September 11th, the SWN instrument aboard SOHO flags a sudden surge in hydrogen emissions. The Lyman Alpha Glow lights up data streams before most ground observers know to look. Backyard telescopes scanning Virgo confirm the hint. SWAN is brightening fast, its tail doubling in length over a single night. Spectra show a volatile rich coma dominated by hydrogen with cyanogen and carbon compounds in the mix. As perihelion nears, the outgassing spikes. Hydrogen production outpaces water vapor by a margin that surprises even veteran comet watchers. The reason becomes clear. The nucleus is cracking under solar heating, exposing fresh ice and releasing trapped volatiles in episodic outbursts. Every new fracture triggers another hydrogen flare, perfectly tuned to space-based ultraviolet instruments. Professional observatories scramble to carve out time. Rubin juggles cadence to chase the evolving coma. Citizen scientists feed the pipeline with timestamps, tail maps, and brightness alerts that steer high-resolution spectrographs to fleeting moments. Jets arc from the core, chemistry shifts by degrees, and the subtle signatures of structural stress accumulate. As September wears on, models warn that the nucleus, already fissured, might not survive its brush with the sun. A breakup could see a debris cloud spectacular to see and instructive to analyze. The subtext for planetary defense is simple. Not all warnings are quiet, linear, or obvious. Sometimes the first alarm is a burst of hydrogen caught by a spacecraft amplified by a global network of amateurs. Another calendar looms over every meeting. April 13th, 2029. Apophis will pass just 32,000 kilometers from Earth's surface, closer than many communication satellites, bright enough to see with the naked eye as it cuts across the night. It was once the headline, Planet Killer, flagged in 2004. That risk has long since been retired, replaced by a rare scientific opportunity, a live global rehearsal for planetary defense. Earth's gravity will reach across space and tug at Apophis, raising tides not of water, but of rock and dust. Scientists expect surface landslides, regoliths shaken loose, perhaps even a subtle reshaping of its silhouette. Such tidal effects have never been measured up close on a body this size. NASA's Osiris Apex spacecraft is en route to rendezvous with Apophis soon after the flyby, tasked with documenting every scar, every rearranged boulder, every trace of Earth's invisible pole. Before and after apps will show how small gravitational nudges change wandering rock and sharpen our playbook for nudging one deliberately if a real threat ever materializes. For the engineers who grew up with Apophis splashed across anxious front pages, the approach carries personal weight. What once felt like dread becomes discipline, tracking, modeling, and training systems that aim to meet a close call with calm precision instead of panic. Threaded through all of this is 3i Atlas, cataloged as C2025N1, closing on Mars with chemistry that refuses to fit our expectations. From its first spectrum, it looked strange. Survey teams flagged the hyperbolic path on July 1st, but the composition is what sent requests flying to the world's largest telescopes. As it crossed roughly 4.4 astronomical units, early data indicated a coma dominated not by water vapor, but by carbon dioxide. August observations reinforced the numbers. Carbon dioxide production near 129 kilograms per second, while water trailed around 6.6, .6, almost 20 to 1. A reversal of the usual rule of bright active comets where water typically overwhelms CO2. Then came the metals. 
high-resolution spectra lit up a clean atomic nickel line on the order of 4.6 grams per second streaming from the coma by late August, while iron, nickel's usual partner in cometary chemistry, fell below detection. Nickel without iron is rare even among interstellar visitors. In ordinary solar system comets, both tend to liberate together under heating. Theories proliferate, unusual formation chemistry, selective loss of iron during a long interstellar drift, the breakdown of nickel-rich organics, or cosmic ray weathering that strips more volatile iron compounds. No single model fits all the data. The debate is lively and unresolved. Mid-August added yet another twist. The Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, scanning in ultraviolet, caught a sudden flare, an outburst that doubled the comet's brightness in under 36 hours. Ground-based photometry showed the tail split into multiple components, dust streaming on diverging paths. These episodic bursts look unlike the familiar water-driven jets of garden-variety comets. They hint at pockets of CO2 or other volatiles erupting as sunlight penetrates fresh fractures. Rotation studies deepen the puzzle. Light curve analysis suggests a slow, possibly tumbling nucleus spinning on an axis that drifts over time. The period stretches past 22 hours with only faint brightness modulation, consistent with a nearly spheroidal shape or a complex non-principal axis rotation. Forecasting outbursts and tail evolution becomes an exercise in humility, with perihelion set for October 29th and a superior conjunction blackout looming from Earth's perspective, spectroscopists are in a race against the calendar to record every line and band they can. Before that, a close pass by Mars offers a unique vantage, orbiters poised to watch an interstellar comet skim past a neighboring world. By month's end, September reads like a four-act lesson. A cluster of asteroid near misses stresses the detection net we've built. A hydrogen-loud comet announces itself in ultraviolet before most telescopes can swing. An impending flyby in 2029 will test our readiness in full public view. And an interstellar outlier insists on chemistry that rewrites assumptions line by line. Maybe it's a coincidence. Maybe it's a hint. Either way, the message is steady. The solar system is active. Our neighborhood is alive with motion, and vigilance is not optional. Our best defense is early detection, open pipelines from discovery to action, and instruments, on Earth and in space, that catch the faintest hints before they become headlines. In this season of close calls and bright tales, preparedness is not a slogan. It's the quiet machinery that turns warning into safety, curiosity into knowledge, and surprise into something we can live with.